Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yulia Panfil. I'm the director of the Future of Property Rights Program at the Think Tank New America. And I'm so excited that you're able to join us for the launch of Displaced in Indianapolis. This is a study that analyzes where within Indianapolis evictions and foreclosures are the most acute, who is most impacted and why. It's part of a larger national study that also looked at Winston-Salem and the Phoenix metro area and developed a national index that ranks more than 2,200 counties on their severity of housing loss. In Indianapolis, this has been a year-long collaboration between New America Indianapolis, New America's Future of Property Rights Program, and the Institute for American Thought at IUPUI and couldn't have been possible without the help of dozens of local experts, advocates, journalists, and municipal leaders who are all working to prevent housing instability and loss across the city. I know that housing loss is a hot topic right now as we brace for the predicted tsunami of um, evictions and foreclosures as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. And in that sense, it's critically important that uh, we understand which parts of the city are the most vulnerable and why, so we know how best to target assistance. But I wanna stress that housing insecurity is not new here. It predates COVID, and if we're going to solve this problem, then we need to understand what's driving it historically and develop long-term solutions that go beyond just eviction moratoriums. So with that, I'd like to welcome you to our event and orient you a bit to the flow of today's discussion. We'll start with two of our report authors, Tim Ravustelli and Abby Chambers, who will have a conversation around the report findings with Oshia Boyd, the editor of the Indianapolis Recorder, and Dan Grossman, the editor at Nuvo. We'll then transition into a second conversation with local and national experts to react to these findings. That conversation will feature Andrew Bradley, Policy Director of Prosperity Indiana, D. Ross, Head of the Ross Foundation, and our very own Molly Martin, Head of New America Indianapolis, and Future of Property Rights Fellow, Malcolm Glenn. And we encourage you to submit your questions via the Q&A and chat functions. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can during the conversation. Thank you again for joining us, and I will turn it over to Tim to take us through some of our findings. Thanks, Yulia. And before I jump in, uh, perhaps Dan and Oshia can introduce themselves as well. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Oshia Boyd. I am editor of the Indianapolis Recorder newspaper and Indiana Minority Business Magazine in Indianapolis, of course. So this issue of housing is very important to the recorder. Um, before COVID ever, uh, the onset of COVID, we actually had the idea to do a package around affordable housing um, back in probably May. And then we decided to hold it off as we kind of saw that COVID was gonna have an impact on housing. And rightfully so, when we held it off, we realized that uh, evictions were going, there was gonna be this tsunami as everyone is talking about of evictions. Luckily they were held off again, but there's still this anticipation of what's gonna happen next. So I'm going to introduce my colleague, Dan Grossman from Nuvo, and he's gonna tell you a little bit more about Dan and what he does at Nuvo. Yeah, hi, thanks, Oshia. And uh, as Oshia said, I'm uh, Dan Grossman, managing editor at Nuvo, which after covering uh, Central Indiana for 30 years as an alternative weekly, is now a nonprofit and publishes exclusively online. In July, we published Evictions Court Diaries by Abby Chambers, a researcher on this project. And uh, in that piece, she describes uh, some of the research she's involved in as a PhD candidate at IUPUI in American Studies, and some of the fraught uh, things that go on in Evictions Court. And of course, this is right up Nouveau's alley because we're very interested in deep dive reporting, especially in this time of COVID and uh, protests in the streets and all these things that are kind of uh, coming together in a bad way to make it harder for people to make a living, um, pay the rent and such. So 
publishing that piece was uh, basically our uh, entrance into a new America's orbit because of course, Abby is one of the researchers here today. She's one of the researchers in uh, the project displaced in Indianapolis. Um, and another of the researchers here today is Tim Robustelli. And I'm going to introduce him. He's a, a policy analyst for the Future of Property Rights Program at New America. He received an MA in International Relations from New York University and has written for the Washington Post, Politico, The Hill, Slate, and CNN, among other publications. So I'll turn it over to you, Tim. Thank you very much, Dan. And uh, I'll just say a quick thank you to Molly Martin as well for organizing this fantastic event. Um, Narmada, if you could just please share your screen uh, with a short slide deck I have to provide a bit of context to the discussion that we'll be having today. Um, next slide, please. So as Yulia mentioned, uh, our report, Displaced in America, looks at housing loss at a number of levels throughout the United States. Nationally, we looked at evictions and mortgage foreclosures at the county level from 2014 to 2016. And based on data availability, we were, about, we were uh, able to get about two thirds of US counties, about 2,200 US counties um, to be included in this study. And we also developed something that we call a housing loss rate, which looks at uh, combined loss through both evictions and mortgage foreclosures. And we think that provides a more holistic view of displacements um, in the area of analysis. Uh, we also did three case studies um, in the Phoenix metropolitan area in Arizona, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and its surrounding county. And then uh, in Indianapolis, in Marion County, working with both New America Indy and IUPUI. And here we were able to analyze uh, evictions and mortgage foreclosures at the more granular level, at the census tract level, to really get a sense of who and where displacement is happening. <clears throat> and so we combined those two mechanisms of loss, eviction and mortgage foreclosure, again, into a housing loss rate. And we were also able to obtain tax foreclosure data in Marion County as well. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the case in every case study, so we declined to incorporate that into our housing loss index, but that still provided some insights as well. And as Abby will expand upon, um, she conducted uh, about 30 interviews uh, throughout Marion County to uh, contextualize what our quantitative data was telling us. Uh, next slide, please. So what you see here, I'll just quickly move through, is our National Housing Loss Index. It ranks U.S. counties based on their combined eviction and mortgage foreclosure rates between the years 2014 and 2018. At the top, you'll see Petersburg City, which is an independent city, a county equivalent in Virginia. You'll see that it has a housing loss rate of just over 12%, meaning that on average between 2014 and 2016, 12 out of every 100 households were being displaced. And within the housing loss index, which compares each county to the national average, uh, Petersburg City has a housing loss index score of six, meaning that it was six times the national average. Now at the bottom of the screen, to turn back to uh, Indianapolis, you'll see that Marion County was ranked 35th out of about 70% of all counties for which data was available. And that's first in Indiana as well. It had a housing loss rate just under 5%, and that was about two and a half times the national average. Next slide, please. So the meat of our report was visualizing housing loss uh, throughout not only the country, but in our three case studies. And you see here uh, the visualization of housing loss rates in Marion County, Indiana from 2014 to 2018. In our case studies, we were able to get uh, a bit more larger data sets temporally. So the uh, time period of analysis is a bit different in comparison to the national level. And so what you'll see here is that Marion County between 2014 and 2018 had a housing loss rate of 4.9%. And that translates into roughly 15,000 households losing their homes each year. The eviction rate I'd like to point out was 6.8%, which is, is quite high in comparison to the national average, and that evictions accounted for 75% of all 
seas of housing loss between 2014 and 2018. To the left is a static image. Uh, in our reports, uh, you'll have interactive maps uh, and I encourage you to visit our website and to check those out. Uh, I'll just point out that the housing loss rate uh, mapped onto Marion County in a bit of a ring uh, around the periphery of downtown. We saw high rates of housing loss both to the west in Wayne Township and to the east in Warren Township. Uh, next slide, please. And just to quickly break things down a bit further, um, this is looking at the mortgage foreclosure rate. Again, you'll see a similar geography to the housing loss rate uh, with high rates of loss in the census tracts surrounding downtown. Uh, the geography of loss here, um, there's a bit more higher rates to the northeast of downtown, uh, both in Warren Township and the track with the highest loss rate is actually in Lawrence Township uh, in the northeast of the county. Next slide, please. And then here is the tax foreclosure rate. Again, we weren't able to obtain data for tax foreclosures for every uh, case study and certainly not every county at the national level in the United States. Again, what we see here is a more pronounced ring of loss surrounding downtown Indianapolis uh, in the near Northeast and the Crown Hill neighborhoods to the Northeast and Northwest of downtown. And you know, while we weren't be able to do um, cross county analysis, we feel that telling the story of tax foreclosures in Marion County was important, giving the attention that out of town investments, um, tax foreclosures um, blights have played uh, in, in Indianapolis and, and the discussions um, in the media over the last couple of years. Next slide, please. And that's it. Um, so that's just to provide a, a brief overview of our mapping efforts within the context of this larger project. And now I'll turn it over to Abby Chambers, our superstar researcher uh, in Marion County. Thank you, Tim. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here with you today. Um, my role in this project was leading the qual qualitative data collection component in Marion County. I'm a social science researcher finishing a PhD in the American Studies program at IUPUI. My dissertation is based on fieldwork and interviews with residents and city leaders about economic development in Indianapolis. And it describes how differing perspectives of development contribute to our continued struggles with economic inequities. Housing is, of course, something that creates and perpetuates inequity. Last year, I worked as a resident scholar with New America Indianapolis and became involved in the Displaced in America study as the boots on the ground researcher in Marion County. I interviewed 31 people, including government officials, housing advocates, real estate developers, community developers, lawyers, service providers, and residents. I collected their expertise and their stories of personal experiences to help us understand the housing related issues that challenge our communities and our city. In these conversations, we talked about how often residents lose their homes, the mechanisms for that loss, be it eviction, mortgage foreclosure, or something else, the root causes of the loss, and what happens to people when they're forced to move. Some of the issues interviewees brought up are borne out in the data that Tim just presented. For example, an, an attorney at a legal services agency talked to me about the foreclosure crisis comparing what his organization is experiencing now to what it was like during the housing crisis a decade ago. He said it still feels like they're in a crisis situation, but it doesn't get as much attention as it used to, and there are fewer resources to dedicate to it, even though the demand has not, doesn't feel to him like it's decreased that much. The Displaced in America study shows that what this attorney is sensing is indeed accurate. There's a quiet crisis of foreclosure still going on both in Marion County and nationally. People I interviewed, of course, talked a lot about evictions too, and many people cited the work of Matt Desmond and Eviction Lab when they talked about the high level of evictions in Marion County, which as Tim just pointed out, comprises the majority of the county's housing loss. But people also talked about some of the harder to track aspects of housing loss, like where people go. When I asked this question, where do people go when they lose their homes, I got a lot of shrugging shoulders and even contradictory responses because this aspect of housing loss is not tracked. 
Some interviewees said they thought people moved out of downtown when they were displaced, but other interviewees said people move into downtown from surrounding townships. Some interviewees said people move east to west and rarely north or south when they're displaced. Now the data shows that this last point is a little bit true. Housing loss does seem to be more significant on sort of an east west, west kind of diagonal axis rather than on the city's north and south sides with some exceptions. Likely what's really happening is that when people are forced to move, they go wherever they can find housing that they can afford. The affordability aspect is critical since housing loss affects low income residents and especially low income residents of color more than others. Additionally, a forced move can throw people into a crisis situation where they must secure some kind of housing within a very short period of time, and they must do this with limited financial resources, which limits their options dramatically. So when people are forced to move, it can mean they must leave an area where they had an established network of supports for themselves and their family. It can mean transferring schools mid-year, which is hard on kids, moving out of a walkable area, moving away from public transit lines, moving further from work. Too often, it means people have to sleep on couches in the, in the meantime or even long term, or that families have to separate so everyone has a roof over their head. One finding that surprised me is that frequently people stay in hotels. This gives them little hope of being able to save money for a deposit on another rental unit because there's not a lot of extra money coming into the household and that hotel bill like rent is always due. For an unknown number of Indianapolis residents, hotels are standing in for traditional forms of housing. Finally, displacement combined with limited resources can mean families are forced to settle into uns into substandard living conditions, tolerate overcrowding like a family of six living in a two bedroom apartment, living with mold, dealing with major housing systems like electricity and plumbing not functioning properly. The story of housing loss in Marion County is one that's contextualized by housing environment that's inhospitable to low income residents, especially those who rent. It leaves them with few options and little assistance, which is something I think we'll talk more about as we continue this conversation. So with that, I'll pass it back to Oshia. Thank you, Abby. We have so much to discuss, and <laughs> this is a lot. So let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, my first question is just kind of talking about the general um, study. You started your research before COVID-19, um, and then as you were in, in the, I guess, in the throes of your research, COVID, the onset of COVID came. So how did COVID impact your research? Or did it? Well, for me, luckily, um, I had actually completed data collection. Um, so for the Marion County component, um, I was in the midst of analyzing the interviews um, and wasn't still trying to schedule with people or anything. Um, so in terms of actually doing the research um, and trying to do interviews, luckily I had that part done. Sure, and, and I can speak a bit about how um, it, it sort of changed the way that we, we thought about this report. Um, obviously, as Yulia mentioned in her opening remarks, housing loss was a prevalent issue in Indianapolis and around the country even before the outbreak of COVID um, in February and March. And what we found is sort of looking at historical data from, from 2008 and throughout the last decade, it's that the same communities that have historically suffered from housing loss are the ones likely to get hit again and again. So while this data isn't, you know, no one can look into the future, but this data gives us a better idea based on past trends, who will be hit when all the renter protections, when all the emergency rental assistance funds and the moratoriums run out come this fall and, and into next year. So and it, it was a, a bit of a balancing act to, to say, here are the long-term trends and, and we need long-term solutions, but it can also help us better direct resources in the immediate crisis uh, in this moment. Thank you. Dan? Thank you. I was, uh, it was surprising to me about your uh, evictions. Uh, data, particularly in uh, Wayne Township, and uh, you talk about the number of census tracts in Wayne Township exhibiting 
the highest eviction rates between 2014 and, and 2018, and it was around 30%. Can you talk about where you're finding the highest rates in Indianapolis and, and what that's due to? Are, are there historical reasons for that? Sure, I can I can speak a little bit to the quantitative side of things, and I know Abby will will want to jump in with what she heard on the ground. Uh, but yes, Dan, to re to reiterate your points, um, we perhaps surprisingly found some of the highest rates of eviction in census tracts um, in Wayne Township uh, near Speedway, and based on uh, a bit of data analysis, drawing data from the U.S. Census Bureau. Some of these tracks had pretty average median annual household incomes and pretty high percentages of homeowners in, in the total population. Um, so we were a bit puzzled by that. I know there's some reporting in the Indie Star and elsewhere about a few bad actors. Um, and maybe I'll pass it over uh, to Abby to talk a bit more uh, about that and sort of this puzzle we're seeing in Wayne Township. <coughs> Yeah, I found it was interesting that um, the data showed um, these high numbers in Wayne Township because um, in much of the field work and many of the interviews, it didn't come up a lot. Um, so when I asked people, um, you know, where where are people being displaced to or where, um, where do people, um, where is this a problem? A lot of people talked about the east side. They talked about um, 38th and Post, 42nd and Post. Not a lot of people talked about the west side. And so that's a little bit of a puzzle. Um, and Tim's right, the, the um, quantitative data in terms of looking at incomes or some of those other factors sort of don't align. Now, the only thing that I did hear, um, I, or I did, I did hear, and then there were some local reports that Wayne Township sees a lot of evictions. Um, so we sort of knew that fact, but as to why, I think that's still a bit of a puzzle. So I find that interesting because I used to actually live in Speedway in Wayne Township, and I actually live in Warren Township now. So <laughs> you guys mentioned both of those townships as uh, trouble areas, so I'm a little, I'm paying extra attention. Um, what do... Tim, you mentioned uh, bad actors, and so you said Abby could talk to that a little bit. Are the bad actors uh, out of town property owners that we're talking about? Um, who are these bad actors? And I'm, I'm assuming they're the out of town property owners who come in and buy property. How does that impact, impact the neighborhood, impact the city when you have people who aren't actually invested in the community, but invested in property? I think those bad actors, they can be out of town property owners. There's, it's sort of like, if you imagine sort of a Venn diagram, the out of town people aren't necessarily bad actors, um, but they can be in town um, owners, can be bad actors too. Um, the issue with out of town property ownership, I think, um, is that when you don't have an owner living in a community, um, you have to imagine the investment is simply in the property. It's a financial investment. Um, it's not necessarily an investment in that community. So that, that individuals maybe not invested in helping to solve the problems that a community might be facing. Um, and so that sort of puts holes in the fabric of a community um, where you have a, a property owner that um, maybe doesn't care as much as if they lived in that community. Um, those are, those are assumptions, that's true, but um, I think that there's been enough reporting um, to show that it's something to keep track of. It's something to investigate. Um, yeah, Tim, anything else on that? No, nothing to, nothing to okay. add. Okay. You covered it well on that. Abby, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about your experience in evictions court and how that kind of jibes uh, with your experience working as a researcher for New America. So um, in that article, I say that as a, as a social science researcher and a qualitative researcher, I try to understand the context of what people are experiencing. So um, in Marion County, when you're researching housing, you've really got to understand eviction, and that means understanding evic eviction court. 
So I did go and observe evictions court in two different townships. Um, and really what I saw, um, kind of the overarching theme was the power imbalance between landlords and tenants. So um, landlords are typically represented in court by an attorney. The landlord who filed the eviction doesn't have to be present in court. The tenant does, otherwise it's an automatic writ of possession. The, the tenant's automatically evicted. Um, and that right there is just a really clear imbalance because a tenant maybe has to take off of work. Some tenants have to bring their children to evictions court with them. Um, and that process can just feel very overwhelming for somebody who has never been through it before, even if you have, um, knowing that there's this imbalance, knowing that on the other side of you in the courtroom is an attorney who is well versed in these legal processes. Um, so I know that there are efforts in Marion County to be able to provide um, legal services to tenants. Um, of course, that, that program just started, of course, it could likely be expanded, um, but that would offer some, some legal balance for tenants. Thank you. So I have a two parter here. So the first part is for Abby, the second part for Tim. So Abby, you talked a lot, you found an interesting find about housing instability. Um, like poverty can be generational. Can you explain how housing instability affects generations? And then Tim, I'll pivot to you. We have a comment, a uh, question from a, uh, an audience member who is asking about, um, have, you, have you been able to tie tax foreclosures to generational housing title issues. So I kind of feel those questions may be connected. So I'll, I'll start with you, Abby. Okay. So yeah, the generational aspect, it is linked to poverty. I mean, um, we know that poverty does get passed down generationally unless there is some sort of um, stop, some sort of something to mitigate that. Um, and of course, poverty and housing instability are linked. I think this really came out when I was interviewing um, a case manager at a homeless shelter. And she said she helped a woman who came in with her children. And that woman said she herself had been in that shelter when she was a child. So when you're raised in this environment of um, sort of perpetual crisis mode and instability, um, and there's nothing to help your own family when your child out of that situation, um, there's also nothing to help you out of it once you reach adulthood and you have your own family. So it just keeps continuing. And to turn to the second part of that question, um, sort of the dynamics surrounding generational housing and tax foreclosure. It's, it's not something that we dug too deeply into in Marion County. I will say throughout the course of the larger research, uh, research what we heard uh, surrounding issues such as heirs property, historical discrimination in the legal system and inability of black households to access uh, lawyers and, and um, individuals that can help them with probating wills. Uh, that disconnect, that inability to um, legally transfer ownership of property, housing, land over generations um, is something that, that creates a host of problems and, and the ownership splits, right, in heirs' property. So um, you could have an original landowner um, who owned the house in the 19th century and today hundreds of his grandchildren, dozens of, of the grandchildren could own the property. and. Those, those grandchildren, those descendants might have wanted to move away. There's not much value in the house anymore. Um, you know, no one wants to put their investments into it because there's this sort of weird ownership model. Um, so that's something that while we didn't see in Indianapolis, it, it's something we saw elsewhere, that, that people move away, the property goes into disrepair, no one's paying taxes, and eventually it's uh, tax foreclosed upon. So given some of the, the racial discrimination, redlining, other issues that we've seen historically in Indianapolis, I wouldn't be surprised if, if a similar dynamic was, was occurring in uh, Marion County. Thank you, guys. I've got one question, it's a follow-up on uh, the Wayne Township from Adam Lepin. And he is talking about the number of evictions and he's asking, quote unquote, quote, are the concerns of 
Wayne Township based off tenant slash evictions or just based on the sheer number of evictions? I think it's the number of evictions that is alarming. Yes, that the, the sheer number of evictions, we, we've seen places where um, filings have actually exceeded the number of rental households in some census tracts. So that is alarming in itself. The rates um, as well, I'll point out, um, some exceeding 30%, which are, are just astronomical um, in regard to evictions. Um, so uh, both, I would say. <clears throat> I guess in particular with Wayne County and also uh, with other parts of Indianapolis was bad data a problem? It, you alluded to it a number of times in the report, bad or missing data. What does that, what happens when you can't find the numbers you need? Sure. So I can, uh, I, I could speak about that all day, given the, uh, the process and the, the efforts that we had to try and collect data. I will say that in Marion County, we were able to find some pretty high quality data when it came to mortgage foreclosures, um, evictions and tax foreclosures. So we were lucky in, in Marion County. That's not the case everywhere in the United States uh, and other counties. Uh, a lot of the data is difficult to access. Uh, it's of poor quality. There's missing data points. There's idiosyncrasies that you sort of need a bit of insider knowledge um, to decipher what you're looking at. When it did come to Marion County, um, some of the secondary data sets that we were hoping to get a look at, code violations, um, ownerships of, of properties, um, so we could sort of look at who those, those bad actors are, um, you know, if they're out of town landlords, if they're local mom and pops landlords, uh, that's where the, the data sort of broke down a little. So a bit of that secondary analysis, um, that's where we had some struggles. And in general, this poor housing data um, gives us an inability to you know, truly understand where this is happening, who it's happening to, to size up the problem and direct outreach resources and, and funds appropriately. I will add um, that that was one way, the code violations dat data was one way that COVID affected us because we did request that, but the person with the city was like, I'm working from home and it's a massive like load of data and um, there's no way I could get get you that from home um, and he wasn't allowed to go into the city county building so there's one way that um, COVID really affected our ability to get the data we wanted to get. And probably an unexpected way as well. <laughs> no one Certainly. Plan. No yeah. one mm -hmm. for COVID for sure. So Tim I want to ask you something I found interesting in your research. Um, you say you must look at Marion County's socioeconomic history to understand the current state of housing and loss, and housing instability and loss. Uh, what, role does, what role does that socioeconomic history play in today's uh, events when it comes to housing? Sure, um, well, I can mostly speak to that from sort of a, a racial equity context. Um, so Indianapolis in the 19th century, it's similar to other uh, northern industrial cities received a, a large influx of uh, black migrants, more or less, from the south during the Great Migration. And uh, due to discriminat discriminatory policies in, in schooling, housing, politics, uh, in the economy, um, you know, they were mostly clustered to uh, certain neighborhoods. Um, one that, you know, comes to mind quickly is along Indiana Avenue. Uh, they were given low paying jobs. Um, they didn't have an opportunity for home ownership. Um, and after all that, um, during you know, urban renewal, uh, the development of IUPUI, the interstate through downtown, a lot of those communities were destroyed. So not only do you lose your housing, your stability, uh, your sense of community, but it's increasingly difficult to find new adequate places to live. Uh, opportunity rich neighborhoods. We call them places with good schools, places with access to public transportation, places with access to good jobs. So what you see is this historical discrimination sort of compounding, um, you know, until today, 
where you have low rates of minority home ownership. You have minorities working in low paying jobs and where they can't afford the rent, they can't afford a down payment. Um, so that that's sort of, we, I think we've only scratched the surface when it comes to that. Um, but we thought it was an important part of the story to tell um, within the Marion County case study. You also in the report talk about uh, the quote unquote habit hab <laughs> habitability trap, sorry, <laughs> tripped on my words. Um, because Indiana residents must pay uh, rent regardless of their housing conditions. So uh, tenants who withhold rent payments are evicted a lot. How, is that something you saw in your research? I'll let Abby tackle that one. I, I know she heard quite a bit about that through her interviews. Yeah, so the habitability trap is, um, you're right, where um, tenants really, they don't have any recourse when they're living um, in, in a housing situation where the landlord isn't repairing things, isn't maintaining the housing up to standards, um, like they're supposed to by law, but um, they're, they're not. So we heard, heard um, from an attorney in particular who said that um, there's nothing that stops a landlord um, from evicting a tenant who reports the landlord um, with code violation, uh, with code enforcement. Um, so, in, and then when that um, tenant is evicted because this um, report goes with the tenant, it doesn't stay with the housing unit, um, that case is just closed. So the landlord never really has to um, address the issues that the tenant raised. And now the, a tenant, the tenant has been evicted. Once somebody has an eviction on their record, it automatically makes it harder to find more housing because a landlord can go and look up somebody's record and see that actually not even that they were actually evicted, but just that an eviction was filed. So the filing alone can make it hard for somebody to find new housing. Um, and it seems like places that will accept tenants who have that eviction on their record are places that may not be maintaining the housing up to standard. So it is this trap where these, these tenants are just stuck in this cycle um, and forced into the substandard housing. Abby, it sounds like this also has something to do with wages. Mm -hmm. um, that those who, who earn low wages stay in um, housing that is really not habitable as you're finding. So kind of talk about the, how the wealth gap affects housing and then can you pivot into um, how people who lose their home, how this kind of spirals into other areas that affect their lives as well. Yeah, sorry, I'm taking a note. So I get both parts of your question. So, when there's not a lot of cushion in, for somebody, they're making low wages, there's not a lot of, a sa of savings, um, you have a medical emergency, you have your car break down, I mean, any number of things that just happen to us in life, um, that can throw somebody into a crisis mode. So immediately they have to make really hard decisions. If they're not already maybe living in crisis mode, um, about, they have to make decisions about what bills to pay, do I repair my car, can I take public transit, you know, I've got to pay daycare, I've got rent, of course. Not paying rent then can lead to an eviction, which can make it harder for people to find new housing. And then again, because of the low wages, people don't have a lot of options. And then now maybe they've got an eviction on their record. Um, this whole situation just really limits people's ability to have control over what's happening in their lives um, because they don't have the economic resources and there really isn't a lot of assistance. Um, there are a few things out there that people can try to tap. There are some organizations, um, community service organizations that may offer some funds. Um, I heard a lot about trustees offices offering funds, but I also heard where those funds run out every month. So um, it's like a certain time of the month when apparently they get like this, their amount of money for the month, you might be able to get help. But of course, um, maybe you have to make an appointment, you have to go during certain office hours, you have to fill out paperwork. And each of these things offer 
more barriers where somebody is already dealing with the situation um, where they're facing a lot of logistical challenges and mental stresses. So um, it just keeps somebody in, in this crisis mode where it's just one thing after another, dealing with one barrier after another. It's really an unhealthy situation for people. One of the, our viewers pointed out that uh, Marion County just passed an ordin ordinance uh, uh, preventing retaliation for reporting housing condition violations, but is that a, is that a complete panacea? No, um, I mean, it's a, it's a start, certainly, um, but there's a long way to go. Well, panelists, we have actually come to the end of our conversation, and we have not even scratched the surface, I don't think, of your report um, or of the issue with housing. So I would encourage everyone to go and read the pick up the report, well, pick up the reports <laughs> uh, online and and dig into it and see what uh, what you found and and read the up about the other cities too because I think there's some interesting things in there that you'll find about housing in in our in the United States, not just Indianapolis. So again, thank you guys for for taking your time out to uh, speak with us today. Thank you, Dan, for co-moderating with me. Tim thank you, Oshia. It was a pleasure <laughs> and. A Thank you, Tim and Abby, for bringing us this information. Thank you. Thank you. So I think that may be my cue, and I want to thank Oshia and Dan and Abby and Tim, and also welcome everyone in the audience. And I hope that you'll stay with us for the next 45 minutes, because we're going to pivot from the report itself and talk about why it matters that we address race honestly and explicitly when we talk about housing loss in Indianapolis and across the nation. So I hope you'll stick with us. I do want, first want to start by thanking Yulia Panville for her leadership of the Future of Property Rights team and for bringing this important work to Indianapolis. And of course, thank Tim Robostelli for his exceptional work and Abby Chambers for her exceptional work on the ethnographic research. Uh, I'd like to introduce my panel too, because I lucked out uh, just as the last panel was absolutely fabulous. We have another fabulous lineup and I'm so honored to be joined by Malcolm Glenn, who is not just a New America fellow, but is in charge of everything. Uh, including Better.com, and I'll let Malcolm tell us a little bit more about his impressive work across workforce, poverty, property, and innovation. We're also joined by Andrew Bradley, who's the Policy Director at Prosperity Indiana, and with the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition. Andrew, if I got that wrong, please do correct me when you come on. Uh, Andrew has also done quite a bit of work over the years on working families, poverty, and livable wage. And then last and certainly not least, Darius D. Ross, who is the founder and president of the Ross Foundation and well known to all of us here in Marion County and Indianapolis as an activist, philanthropist, and someone really leading the charge and doing literal hands-on outreach uh, to residents and for tenants' rights. So I'm gonna to get to the fabulous panel in a moment, but first I wanna set the stage a little bit. As I said, my name is Molly Martin. I direct New America Indianapolis, which is a program based here working across Indiana, and we focus our work on racial and economic equity. So the issue of housing law certainly hits right at the heart. In a place like Marion County, in a place like Indianapolis, that is 45% non-white and more than 30% black. Uh, we have an opportunity, an obligation, and a need to do something for our neighbors. Uh, while this should be a moral question and just a good person thing to do question, it's also an economic one because Indianapolis lives or dies by the success of our neighbors regardless of their race. Uh, as, at any time when we talk about race with New America Indianapolis, I wanna remind everyone that race is not a monolith, uh, that race and ethnicity are different and we'll be doing our best to kind of navigate those waters. Uh, so Malcolm, I'm gonna to come to you first. We live in a city here in Indianapolis uh, that has a huge poverty crisis. And the poverty crisis is worse for our Black and Latinx neighbors. Uh, the median household income is lower in the state of Indiana as a whole. Uh, it's about 42,000 a year for Hispanic households, about 32,000 for Black households. Uh, not much higher, it's in the 50s for white households, but there's a huge gap. Uh, the median household value um, is, the median home value is uh, lower in predominantly Black neighborhoods. And this report that New America has released actually shows that the rate of housing loss through eviction or foreclosure 
culture is worse for black households than for white households and worse for Latinx or Spanish speaking households than for anyone else. So why does it matter? What's, draw me a line, Malcolm, from this racial disparity to housing loss and, and what's the sort of work that you lead? Well, thanks, Molly, for setting that stage. And I think you're absolutely right. The very short version of, I think, what this conversation is going to look like is that the trends have been bad. They were made worse in 2008, and they've actually gotten worse since then. Um, but hopefully, we can kind of step back and sort of do some stage setting, as you mentioned. Um, thank you for your very kind introduction. Uh, I, I don't know if I do everything, but I certainly do wear a couple of hats. Uh, as Molly mentioned, my name is Malcolm Glenn. And I'm just absolutely overjoyed to be here in my capacity as a fellow for a New America's Future of Property Rights program. And I'm super excited and really proud of the work that the team has put together for the Displaced in America report that was recently released. Um, but as Molly mentioned, I'm also the Director of Public Affairs at Better.com. And Better is one of the leading digital homeownership platforms in America. And in addition to that role, I serve as a senior fellow at the Center for Workforce Inclusion, um, where I look at what the future of work will look like. And I think the really interesting thing about all of those roles, to Molly's point, is that they're all really tied together. And you cannot look at housing in a sort of vacuum. But the reality is housing is deeply intertwined and interrelated and integrated with how families live, work, and prosper or don't uh, within cities. Um, and uh, you know where you live just determines so many things. It's really as simple as that. You know, Earlier in my career, I worked in education reform. And one of the really central tenets of our work was this phrase, uh, your zip code shouldn't determine your child's destiny. But the reality is that it does. For so many families in so many places across the country, um, you are wedded to a certain quality of education based on where you are able to work. And for reasons that Tim and Abby and, and Molly and folks will continue to get into, um, many, many families are aggressively and intentionally uh, limited in, as to where they can uh, live for a whole host of reasons. Uh, where you live determines uh, where people are able to get access to jobs. You know, we're on a webinar in the middle of the day and are able to largely do our jobs on Zoom, but there are so many people who cannot do their jobs on Zoom, who are not a part of, you know, this so-called, uh, you, know, uh, you know, computer knowledge, whatever you want to call it, economy. And so they need to think about things like, am I a, commuti uh, a commuting distance away from where the jobs are? And uh, do I live in a place where, uh, particularly with uh, an unbelievable amount of uncertainty like we have today where I'm going to be able to keep my job. Um, and so uh, there are a number of sort of open questions as to what certain sectors of work will even look like going forward when it comes to office work versus remote work versus essential work. Um, and even notwithstanding those questions, the challenges as to where you live and what that determines in your life are massive. And so, you know, why is this all relevant? Um, I, I spent a number of years before um, uh, I joined the roles that I'm doing now, um, leading policy for underserved communities at Uber. And one of the most striking statistics that I took away from my time there was, um, based on this longitudinal study um, over a number of years from Harvard University, the greatest determining factor as to whether a family that is in poverty can actually work to exit poverty, to climb out of poverty, is their commute time. And so to, to a point that Tim made earlier, that means making a decision where you live based on access to public transportation, determining whether you can afford a, a car if you're going to live in a place where you need a car, in some instances, two cars if you're going to require multiple cars for the service of your family. So housing, whether you're talking about renting or owning, uh, just plays all of these um, absolutely substantive, meaningful roles in determining sort of the short-term economic situation for a number of people. And you know this has been touched on earlier, and I think we'll continue to touch on it as, as the session goes on, but this matters not for individuals, not just for individuals, but across generations as well. And those disparities in housing are exacerbated uh, when you look at the intergenerational gap between races. Um, you know, depending on the numbers you're looking at, the gap between black home ownership and, and white home ownership is something between 25 and 30 percentage points. That number has grown since the 2008 crisis. And based on what we've seen in the context of COVID, it is likely to continue to grow. Uh, before COVID started at the beginning of the year, um, it was expected that by 2031, the decline in black household wealth based on the 2008 downturn would be almost 10 percentage points worse than the, the decline in white household wealth. Uh, and, and so that's kind of worth stating uh, overall wealth is going to be down as a result of 2008 across all racial groups. 
It will be down again as a result of COVID across all racial groups, but it will almost certainly be significantly worse for black families than it is for any other racial group. And so um, we don't even know the full extent of what COVID is going to do uh, in terms of exacerbating this housing crisis. Um, but what we do know is that when evictions and foreclosure moratoriums start to expire, it's gonna have really damaging downstream impacts on education in terms of exacerbating job loss. And it's gonna make getting access to a whole host of goods and services that much more challenging for a group of folks for whom the challenges were already quite uh, meaningful and substantive. So I am sure we will spend a lot more time talking about a lot of these issues as time goes on, but as a means of sort of um, uh, laying the groundwork and kind of zooming out, um, uh, I'll stop there and look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you so much, Malcolm. That's so important to remember that, especially for black and brown Americans, the economic prospects and the professional prospects had been greatly diminished by a lot of systemic racism and systemic bias in the way things were built. And then these setbacks come rolling through, like housing loss or like this pandemic. Andrew, what is this looking like here in Indiana? And what are the sorts of policy levers that you think we need to be pressing to make sure that we address this overall, but that we're also really honest with ourselves about the racial specific, the race specific implications of all of this. Thank you so much, Molly. And thanks for having me uh, be part of this conversation, as well as to the other panelists and the folks at New America for putting this on. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Andrew Bradley, and I'm policy director with Prosperity Indiana. We are the statewide association for community economic development. So those are the folks throughout the state of Indiana who are strengthening our communities and improving people's lives. And just as you say, um, and as your panelists have said so far, COVID really has just exacerbated some pre-existing conditions in the housing instability uh, realm. Um, and that's, it's also really driven the importance of making sure that we take racial equity into account when we're coming up with policy solutions. So some of your panelists have addressed some of these points, but I wanted to uh, to tack on a couple of additional data points and then talk a bit about some of the policy advocacy um, that we've been doing uh, to answer the question of what would happen uh, when the eviction moratoriums are lifted and we're starting to see that. Um, so even before COVID started, um, housing, affordable housing was out of reach throughout Indiana and specifically in Marion County. Um, and in part that has to do with the legacy of policies that um, Indiana has taken place. Uh, Marion County doesn't exist in a vacuum when it comes to policy decisions. So many of its choices are made in Indianapolis, but at the state capitol, and then of course at the US capitol at the White House as well. Um, so for example, Indiana, Indianapolis has the same minimum wage as the rest of the state at 725. And at that minimum wage, affordable housing in Indianapolis as in the rest of the state, can buy you an apartment at $377 a month. Uh, but the uh, fair market rent for a two-bedroom apartment in Indianapolis is $946 a month, uh, with a, a housing wage uh, to afford that at $18.19 an hour. So imagine that almost triple um, the minimum wage in order to afford that affordable housing. Um, and when it comes to COVID, COVID's really been a triple whammy, especially for people of color um, in, throughout Indiana and including Marion County. Um, we've seen the data showing that people of color have been hardest hit by the actual public health ap ep uh, epidemic, uh, by job and income loss. Um, there have been over 150,000 first-time unemployment claims in Marion County alone. Um, and some uh, breakdown of that data from the Federal Reserve Bank finds that 21% of the unemployment claims throughout the state have been um, for uh, black workers, whereas they only make up 9.4% of the labor force. So that's a really disproportionate impact um, that black workers have. And that also includes the type of occupations um, that have seen the most layoffs, even in the most recent uh, unemployment stats, you still see that accommodations and food and beverage and a lot of those uh, low paying jobs that are kept low by policy decisions are really being affected. Um, and that really translates to the housing market, 
because we've seen some data from um, the housing industry showing that the folks that are continuing to still miss um, their rent are coming most from the twenty to thirty thousand dollar income range, and that is that low income service sector range that are typically held by people of color, by women, by uh, low income renters. And when that's concentrated in places throughout the city, just like what New America's uh, data is showing, then you're seeing really pockets uh, that are being hit hard, and especially people of color. Another statewide fact that I'd like to share with you, we, we crunched some census numbers and found um, that across the state of Indiana, um, in terms of the proportion of households that are cost burdened by housing, meaning that they spend more than uh, a third of their income on housing, 40.4% um, of white Hoosier households are cost burdened by housing, but that proportion is 44.5% for Latino households and 51.4% for black households across the state. And then again, you imagine that's super concentrated in some of the specific areas that, that this report we're talking about today is covering. So again, that's all what was happening kind of as we enter into COVID um, and as we're seeing the job and income loss um, result in housing instability. So to combat that, Prosperity Indiana um, had gathered with some advocacy partners um, actually back at the end of the last um, General Assembly session. Um, uh, folks, before we're talking about the um, uh, Marion County's uh, um, policy about renter protections, that's something that they put into place early this year. The General Assembly um, had then passed a bill to undercut that through preemption. And then at the last moment, Governor Holcomb vetoed that just as COVID was coming into place. Um, so really all it would take is for the General Assembly to override that veto or simply to pass a new law in the next, next, next session and you would see those new eviction powers be reinstated uh, the way that they would have been. So that's something that's kind of hanging over our heads in the next session. Um, this group of advocates that we brought together called the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition um, has also been thinking about what, what's going to happen when the eviction moratorium is lifted. We've done some data showing or done some research showing that we expect multiple waves of evictions, one that would start just as soon as the moratorium is lifted. And we started to see that in the state when the state moratorium was lifted right before the CDC's federal moratorium um, was put down. Um, another one when unemployment benefits um, and any sort of stimulus payments run out as they are starting to do. Um, but then based on the Great Recession, we anticipate a third or a later wave of evictions that would happen the year after. <clears throat> uh, because during the Great Recession, the peak of evictions happened the year following the peak in unemployment. So this is not gonna be a problem that's going to go away soon. Um, and we have been advocating uh, at the state level for rental assistance programs that are not only targeted um, and available to low-income renters, including people of color, but also that has a, a way to do outreach to those communities and populations. And I think that's something that your next speaker, Dee, will be able to, to speak to, because I know that he's been involved in some of those conversations. Um, but just uh, to, to wrap this up and move the conversation along, a couple of the things that we've been recommending moving forward is uh, for the state to have a housing stability task force to really help bring in the voices of the people affected, including renters, people of color, but also landlords and also experts in the connections between public health and housing to a housing stability task force that could inform some of the use of CARES Act funds and other uh, philanthropic funds that may be able to be on the table. And then we also would like to see a housing stability dashboard be put on the state's COVID website. Um, we think that that would be a really important place to be able to measure the number of evictions that come as a result of COVID um, that are coming through the court systems that may be temporarily on pause but are likely to start again, as well as some of the outcomes of the rental assistance programs so that we could line up to see where the applications and where the approved and disapproved um, uh, applications are coming from and how well that lines up with the types of maps 
that New America has put out today. So I'll pause there, but have to talk any more about any of this. Thank you so much, Andrew. That's so helpful. You know, Dee, as Andrew said, I want to come over to you because if Malcolm set the national stage and Andrew set the state stage, you do the most hyper-local work of anyone that we've talked to on this call. We'd love to hear a little bit more about the foundation, about your tenants' right advocacy, and I'd love your take. Do we have it right? You talk to people every day. How much of a factor do you think race is in housing loss in Indiana? Yeah, uh, thank you, Molly. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having me on. Uh, yeah, my name is D. Ross. I'm the founder and CEO of the Ross Foundation, We're a grassroots organization in Indianapolis, Indiana. Our mission is to create more, uh, is to take the community out of survival mode into thriving mode by creating effective youth programs, repairing our communities and development leaders. We also uh, oversee the only Indianapolis Tenants Rights Union, the first Tenants Rights Union in the state. Uh, which we do a lot of tenant advocacy, um, boots on the ground, going door to door, educating people about their rights, help with them with letters um, to their landlords, to property managers, to the judges, uh, helping them get connected to legal, pro 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 legal services and wrapped around services that can help them, assisting them with uh, addressing any um, internal problems in, within their homes, by contacting the Merritt County Health Department or whoever it, the powers may be. Um, I also sit on the Hoosier Housing Needs Coalition also, uh, where we've been advocating and pushing uh, Gov Governor Hoke on to push the eviction moratorium back and extend, and extend it, and also be more intentional about connecting, getting connected with uh, black and brown communities about with these resources that's being provided um, one, of, one of the things I want to highlight is um, we can have all the resources and services in the world coming to our state, but if they're not being trickled down to the ones directly impacted the most, it defeats the purpose. And we have to be more intentional um, when we and have a more um, intact plan where those, when the funding comes in, we have a plan where we can deliver those items uh, to the people directly impacted the most, um, those resources. Because a lot of people in black and brown communities that I found uh, on a local level um, don't have access to Wi-Fi or internet or TV or radio or social media or any of those outlets to really know about the eviction and moratoriums, to know about the executive orders, to know about any resources or services that's out there. And quite frankly, um, most of the community centers that are uh, getting all these funds are working remotely. They don't have the capacity to do outreach at this time uh, due to COVID-19. And, and so I think it's imperative uh, when we're talking about making sure that these resources is getting to the people directly impacted the most. Now, disproportionately, black and brown communities are impacted by COVID-19 the most. Um, and, and before COVID-19, they were disproportionately um, impacted by poverty the most. And so it's a direct correlation when you see a, a spike in COVID-19, uh, you have to really seriously look into the housing situation, the poverty, the poverty levels in that community where you're seeing the spike in those zip codes, because well, if they're being evicted out of their homes, especially if they have color, they are more likely to catch COVID-19. Uh, one story I, I, hi I highlight before in the past is it was an elderly black lady who was unlawfully kicked out of her home, not knowing her rights. And um, two weeks later, she catches COVID-19. This is here in Marion County. And she ended up passing away through, uh, from COVID-19. Uh, she didn't make it. And so I just want to put that into perspective how so serious this situation is uh, when we're talking about people uh, becoming homeless or use, uh, losing their homes or being uh, displaced. Um, they are more exposed to catching COVID-19 or more uh, exposed to uh, suffering from some any type of uh, pandemic or virus that's out there. And so we wanna make a safe, we wanna be able to put everyone in a safe living condition. And then also we also address that 
it's been an ongoing issue uh, during COVID-19 and prior to COVID-19 is it's a lot of deplorable living conditions, especially on the far east side of Indianapolis. Um, and at one point, we were number two in the entire country in evictions behind New York City. And we're not nearly the population of New York City. So you know it's just not people not paying their rent, uh, being put out of their homes. It's discrimination. It's people not knowing their rights. It's people being targeted and unlawfully being put out of their homes. And, and so that's the need. And, and so with the Indianapolis Tenants Rights Union, we try to fill that need as much as possible um, with uh, home, we do home literacy programs, we do financial literacy programs, and we also hire 20, uh, 20 tw uh, tenant advocates across America, I mean, across, excuse me, <laughs> across Marion County <laughs> um, to, to be split up in different neighborhoods on the east, west, um, uh, and south side of town, which are the hardest hits um, when we talk about evictions. And so, yeah, we're doing a lot of advocacy work and um, we're here to do the work. Thank you so much, Steve. That's terrific. And I would point folks to the chat. Early on in the chat, we posted the Ross Foundation website uh, where you can learn more about the work. And also in the chat, we posted the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana's efforts uh, on fair housing basics. They're doing some fair, houses, fair housing basics training uh, here in the fall. You know, Dee, one thing that you brought up is she didn't know her rights someone doesn't know their rights. It's, I don't like to go to, you know, civil court. If I have a speeding ticket, I can't imagine going when the stakes were so high to small claims court and risk losing your home. Um, Dee, I'll come to you first, and then Malcolm, I'd like to come to you. Talk to me a little bit about the rights, the, the mythology that you think. What do you think people believe their rights are, and what's one common mistake, Dee, that you think tenants are making when they're asked to leave their home or in financial straits? So, um, so um, I I'd like to allude to the I'd fact like to allude to the um, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Uh, I would like to allude to the fact that we have one of the poorest tenant laws in the country, entire country. So a lot of people overlook that a lot on the local level and sometimes on the state level. Uh, when I'm dealing with a resident, um, they do not know that they have to still pay rent in the state of Indiana. They usually try to withhold rent. And that is like the biggest uh, indicator of them being uh, put out of their homes and being evicted um, because they not, they're not aware that this is a law that you have to still pay your rent. You cannot withhold rent. And even if you live in, in, in habitable living conditions. And then also um, they don't know how to, uh, a lot of people are not, I guess, experience in do keeping documentation and receipts, um, you know, keeping, taking pictures, uh, you know, keeping any type of evidence to support their claims, or even if they make the repairs on their own, how to justify that and uh, rent costs and, and not being evicted. Um, they don't know those things, and some of them don't know the steps when they live in a mold or ceilings is caved in and water is coming down their wall and uh, feces is growing on their walls. It's a lot of deplorable living conditions. You won't believe it in, in Indianapolis that's similar to what I just described. And there are children still living in their that household right to this day. Um, and, and some of them don't know to contact the Marion County Health Department. A lot of them um, are in fear. Um, speaking out against their property manager or landlord in, in fear of retaliation. Um, and a lot of them have retaliated. And it was a similar situation in Meadowlark Apartments on the Far East Side, where the entire apartment complex, um, uh, the property managers was basically telling the, the African American population that they could not park in front of their homes but was allowing everyone else to park in front of their homes. And if they said, if they try to park in their homes, they will retaliate and evict them. They were literally evicting people left and right of color uh, from that establishment until the Ross Foundation got involved 
and we connected with the Indiana Civil Rights Commission and filed a lawsuit, which turned that situation around. And we went out there to do a lot of advocacy and education. But what we found out was a lot of people were scared to even speak out about the situation that was going on. And it was even deeper situations than just not parking in front of their homes. But they were scared. They was in fear of retaliation because on the far east side, it's a lot of low income apartments. And so that's the biggest concentration of apartment complex uh, pluses. And so that's like the last option before becoming homeless is that side of town. And they didn't, and when you lose hope inside of things, you know, you try to just um, deal with the situation and settle with the environment and circumstances, so circumstances you're in. Thank you so much, Dee. Uh, that's a really startling story, but I think one thing that leapt out to our researchers and to me when we were doing this research is I was shocked to find out that you couldn't withhold rent in Indiana uh, due to disrepair or an uninhabitable condition. Yeah. You know, yeah. one thing that you've mentioned, and Malcolm, I'll, I'll come to you, is the idea that navigating these systems isn't always explicitly racist. It's sometimes oppression by omission. You know, I will only tell my black residents X and I will tell my white residents Y. Malcolm, things like this, you know, why do you think it is that interfacing with housing and banking systems is so fraught for so many black and Hispanic Americans? Well, I think there's a, a slightly more complicated answer and a simple one. I'll start with the simple one, which is, um, and you cannot state this starkly enough, uh, the answer is slavery. And it's really, really simply tied back to the origins of how this country was founded. Uh, black families, of course, couldn't own property. They were the property. And so when white families had children, uh, they were able to pass their property, both the homes and the enslaved people, onto their children. Um, when slavery was abolished, there were some Reconstruction era efforts to grant property in some isolated instances to newly freed people. Uh, but then the rise of Jim Crow and a whole host of very explicit government-sponsored segregation efforts really undermine all of, all of that work. And then you get to the 20th century and you have some really explicit efforts um, that uh, reinforced what was already a pretty inequitable system, um, particularly things like redlining, which was uh, efforts by both local governments and federal governments in partnership with private sector actors uh, to, not, to deny access to a whole host of goods and services for people strictly and exclusively based on where they live. So if neighborhoods are largely segregated based on race, then it's easy for mortgage lenders or real estate agents or other businesses to simply say, we are not gonna serve those people. We know those people are overwhelmingly black. We're not saying we're not serving black people, but we can effectively do so by not serving those people. And so redlining exacerbated those existing inequities and made it harder for black people Black families to own homes. And then in 2008, we saw that Black families were disproportionately the target of so many of these predatory lending practices that led to the 2008 crisis, meaning that even for Black families that did own, own homes at that time, they were more likely than their white counterparts parts to actually lose their homes as a result of the crisis. And I think it's worth sort of putting some numbers behind this because these things are so deep-seated and they are so foundational to this country um, but the impact to today is really really stark when you look at the numbers so black families basically started in the negative from slavery up to the point of today and you hear a lot about the income gap you hear about it from a gender perspective you hear about it from a race perspective and it's meaningful black women make something like 67 cents for every dollar that white man makes that number is a little bit higher for black men in the 70s or 80s depending on what source you're citing, but the wealth gap is orders of magnitude worse. For every $100 of wealth that a white family in the United States has, black families have about $5.04. So you're talking about a, an income gap that is huge, significant, and exacerbates a whole host of inequities that exist today. But the wealth gap based on race, white families, because of all of the things that we've talked about, only on a surface level, have about 20 times the wealth of black families, the disproportionate sum of which is based in their homes. And so when you think about this crisis, you're talking about exacerbating some, some 
pretty foundational and existential issues for black families. There are policy initiatives to fix some of this stuff. There are down payment, uh, uh, home down payment um, assistance programs. Um, there are credit access bills that would actually create opportunities for the credit invisible to be involved in lending practices. Joe Biden has a first time home buyer tax credit that he's offering up as a part of his housing plan. But ultimately you're talking about making incremental progress around some existential problems that exist in both housing and in a whole host of other economic respects that have made it more challenging for black families relative to their white counterparts. Thank you, Malcolm. That is stark and it's a great reminder. And I believe I read the, from uh, the National Prosperity Initiative that black wealth is trending towards 0% uh, here in the coming decades if we don't act now. Uh, and certainly uh, Latinx and Hispanic families are facing a similarly steep slope. Andrew, we, we've heard a lot about the importance of having lots of people around the table. And it sounds like, for one, we need a far more racially diverse set of decision makers and we need far more racially diverse folks in banking, in lending, um, but we also need, we still need landlords at the table, right? And, and we still need folks who are perhaps not always in great company <laughs> to come to the table and craft solutions together. And we had a question from the chat from Mandla about how we start to write this balance of power. How do we even, where do we even begin to make tenants and land and landlords give them kind of an equal playing field? Are you working on anything like that? Can you, can you solve it for us in the next 10 minutes? Um, yeah, I think that is a really important question. And I think that it is important, um, if nothing else, just from the practical nature of policy making, um, especially in a, um, a policy landscape like Indiana's, it's difficult to get legislation over the hump at the state house unless you are including um, uh, both uh, the, the supply and the demand side of any policy issue especially if you're coming from the side of, say, uh, low-income and vulnerable tenants. Um, so that is part of why we've come up with this idea of a, a housing stability task force that definitely does include different parts of the, uh, the housing sector that includes not only landlords and people who have investments in housing, but also tenants, and then that connection between public health and housing. And so in terms of the idea of like rebalancing, I think that that gets to some of that idea of, you know, COVID has further tipped the scales and it, it becomes a public health threat to have more evictions. And that's something that the CDC has now explicitly recognized with their moratorium. Um, that, and I think some of your panelists mentioned that earlier, that any um, evictions increase the threat to the entire community of spread of COVID. And that's something that I've actually seen some recent research on showing that um, when families are at threat of eviction, they tend to double up. Um, you know, one family comes and stays with another, and that increases the chance of a spread, not just within that household, um, but then to other households and throughout the community. And in fact, some of that research was showing that depending on the size of the community, that you could have um, as low as for every 60 evictions, you might end up with one additional COVID death in a large city. Um, and that has really, really strong implications for uh, uh, not just the housing sector, but for public health and for policymakers to take into account. So to be able to address that, they need to, to look at things that would balance uh, landlord and tenant interests. But some things that they may want to look at, um, some of the things that have been discussed a little bit before include uh, preventing landlord retaliation at the statewide level so that you're not just protecting that in Marion County, but throughout the state. Um, you might also want to make sure that you prohibit courts from disclosing information related to evictions where the actions against the tenant um, are dismissed or not prosecuted. So that's the case where even if an eviction is filed but not granted, that stays on a, a renter's uh, record for many years. And there are policy options to basically wipe that clean off of a tenant's record. Um, several other things that we may want to look at. Um, one that applies to the way that rental assistance programs have been enacted. 
at the state level, they've been voluntary for landlords to participate in. And the reason that the state has given for that is that um, there is not a way to uh, uh, prohibit discrimination of income, meaning where, land, where tenants are getting the source of their rent money. Um, landlords can say, no, we don't want to take it because it came from a public source or a rental assistance program. That may require some legislation if, and that may be necessary if housing instability continues into 2021 the way we expect it to. Thank you so much, Andrew. And you touched on something really important that also came up in the chat, which is that landlords are as much gatekeepers of public health right now as any of us are through individual action. And that's a new role for a lot of people who probably didn't sign up for that. And it's a really important role. You know, also speaking to the question in the chat about the public health implications of all of this, uh, a lot of this points back to wages. And, and we've heard from a variety of folks today that the Midwest, of course, has historically flat wages. It's been something of a point of pride, right, to say we kept our wages flat because we're a very employer-friendly culture. Uh, that is not great for workers. And here in Indiana, where uh, I want to say it's 20% of Hoosiers make less than, no, it's 25% of Hoosiers make less than $20,000 a year and therefore could not afford uh, the average rent of a two bedroom that, that Andrew noted. And during this pandemic, to take care of their own health, they may have to stay away from work for a week because we know that ranks of folks who work in service and food prep and retail, really important honorable work, but we know that those ranks were dominated by women and people of color. And those folks here in Indianapolis make up 50 and 30,000 um, of the workforce respectively. So if 50,000 retail workers in Indianapolis take a week off, that retail worker is going to lose an average of $525 that week. That is definitely rent money, grocery money, and it could set them back in a variety of ways. And so just being able to pay the bills uh, is a public health issue and certainly ties uh, to housing in the COVID-19 pandemic. So as we're wrapping up here in the last few minutes, I'd like to go around to each of you and I'd like you to suggest you have the, the magic wand, I hand it to you, and you can make one change in housing policy in the state, in the city, um, in federal aid that you think will benefit black and brown communities and start to tip the scale. What is that one thing you do if I, if I make you king for a day? So Dee, I'm gonna start with you. Yeah, uh, so I know definitely uh, the biggest need is um, Taking away that, changing that law where you know you can you can withhold rent if you're living in habitable living condition, because in black and brown communities, it's a lot of deplorable living conditions. There's a lot of people living in um, mold and feces and have mushrooms growing on a wall, uh, just uh, water over 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 flooding uh, throughout their home they should be able to withhold their rent if their property manager or landlord refuses to any repairs in a timely manner. And that's not right. No one should uh, have to live in those circumstances or conditions. And sometimes, the data, and sometimes the data doesn't show always where the need is. So I just wanna point that out. That's a really important point, Dee. And you know, there's actually a piece, Malcolm, that you wrote that speaks to kind of the hidden epidemic of housing loss. And if you look back at the New America study, we saw some census tracts with high percentages of loss that surprised us. We can't always see who's losing their homes and we can't always see what's going on behind the front door, who's been unable to repair something, uh, who's been unable to leverage their tendency to get their landlord to do the right thing. So Dee, I'm really glad that you brought that up. So we have D coming in to say we need to right the balance by empowering tenants to be able to withhold rent when their safety or their health is at issue. Malcolm, what would you do with the magic wand for a day? Yeah, I'll go in a slightly different direction and say I think we need to fundamentally rethink and expand credit access. Uh, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more by saying there was a bill that was introduced in the Senate last year and it was called the Credit Access and Inclusion Act. It was a bipartisan bill. Um, a Republican and a Democratic co-sponsor. And, and something like this would be really, really monumental and because the, one of the biggest inputs that goes into determining whether a person can, can get access to a whole host of financial services, including home loans, is their FICO credit score, which I will note is a uniquely American 
entity. There's no other country in the world where there's a similar credit score structure. And that credit score has hundreds of, as you all mentioned, sort of behind the scenes inputs, most of which take many, many years to build. And many folks would say are deeply discriminatory in their own, life, their own right. Black families are as much as 20% uh, more likely to be what we call credit invisible, meaning they don't have that history of payments through things like student loans and mortgages and car payments. Uh, and they're disproportionately likely to be uh, incarcerated, which means they emerge from having served time behind bars with an inordinate amount of fines and fees that they have to pay off before they can start to get access to these services. And so they're effectively eliminated from being able to engage in the home ownership process. And so there have been efforts over the years, things like the Fair Housing Act of 1968, there are some provisions of the voting, uh, excuse me, the Civil Rights Act of 1965, as well as the creation of the CFPB uh, that have done away with, I think Molly, you mentioned this, the overt racism, but there is still this de facto racism in all of these systems. And until we start to kind of think about how to change the practices of the systems that underpin the systems, and I think credit access is one of them, and we're still going to have a long way to go. So I think changing the way we think about the inputs that determine whether people get access to loans and, and financial services would be really, really meaningful in pushing it forward. It's incredibly helpful. So Malcolm is advocating for a, a real change in approach to credit and finance in this country. So important. Andrew, what about you? Well, I definitely wouldn't disagree with anything that my co-panelists have said. Uh, but I would like to put out that we can't rebuild and recover until we're adequately taking care of basic needs. Um, and when it comes to housing, we can't have housing affordability and security until we have housing stability um, in the face of this pandemic. So if I could wave my magic wand, I would have everybody listening to this podcast or the, um, this webcast uh, contact Indiana senators and ask them to... Um, to help follow the House's lead in passing $100 hundred billion uh, for housing stability and rent assistance. And that's what's going to allow Indiana to unlock its shuttered rental assistance program. And that's what's going to allow the funds to be able to get down to the community level. And as Dee said, to really have some intentional partnerships with the folks on the ground who are gonna be able to make sure that people are able to stay in their homes and avoid eviction and homelessness. Thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, I could not have ended better than my three panelists just did, so I will wrap us for the event today. I want to thank Andrew, Malcolm, and Dee for joining us for the second half of the conversation. I want to thank Abby, Tim, Oshia, and Dan for the first half really taking a deep dive into Displaced in America. If you registered for this event online, we'll be sure that we send you a link to other resources and the report itself. You can all, also always reach me at martin at newamerica.org. So as we close out today, I'd like to thank our partners at Nuvo News Weekly and at the Indianapolis Recorder as always for a rich discussion. Thank you so much. Please everyone stay well and if you need help and immediate assistance with your housing, please do see the Fair Housing of Central, Center of Central Indiana's website for more information. Thank you so much. Take care and have a good day.